Hi there, hope you're having a good day. In today's video, we've got so much to talk about because since I dropped the breakdown yesterday for the fight between Tremayev and Whitaker, it's now emerged that Magomed Ankalaev may have a staph infection going into his fight this weekend against Alexander Rakic. Whitaker has also done an interview with Daniel Cormier where he gives us some juicy insight into what his game plan and strategy is going to be for his fight against Chimaev this weekend. So we're going to be taking a look at that. And as ever, we'll also be breaking down a couple of the fights from UFC 308 this weekend. In this video specifically, we'll be taking a deep dive into the matchup between Ankalaev and Rakic, as well as the main event between Ilya Topuria and Max Holloway. So if you're planning on betting these fights this weekend, stick around, make sure you watch those breakdowns, because we're going to be taking a deep look into them from a betting perspective. I think you're going to find the information that I've found in my research very, very useful. And if you're going to be betting the fights this weekend, you might also want to consider trying out my live betting service for the UFC. Live betting on the UFC is my speciality. I've been live betting on the UFC for 15 years. And within that time, we've made a profit on approximately 70% of UFC events. We perform very, very well on it. So if you watch the UFC every week, it's an absolute no-brainer to jump on board. Take advantage of my live betting service because essentially you're going to be earning money while watching the sport that you love. If you don't like it, it's no problem. You can always get a refund from me, but I'm sure you will like it. At the moment, there are spaces available. There are very limited spaces in the live betting group, and we're very close to reaching the uh, the limit on the group. Now, the reason why I have to cap the number of people in the group is because the more people that live bet the same thing at the same time, the faster the odds decline and become suspended. So I set a cap on the number of people in the group to make sure everyone in the group can get in on the bets at reasonable odds. But we're very, very close to that limit now. And what always happens is whenever we've got spaces available, they tend to stay available for a while. And then when the member cap is reached, this thing literally sells out for months and it's very, very difficult to get in. There's a waiting list system, all that kind of stuff. Um, so don't miss out. It's a great event this weekend. We're performing extremely well on live betting, you know, over the last sort of couple months because we had this little break even period. But things are really starting to pick up again now. And I'm pretty sure we're going to go on another giant winning run and take another big leg up very, very soon. Just last weekend, we had our second biggest winning night of the year, which obviously isn't reflected on the uh, profitability chart yet because it hasn't been updated because we're not at the end of October yet. And I'm hoping we're going to have another big winning event this weekend to add to the money we made on last week's card. Very, very confident we're going to do the business. So let's now jump in to... The first fight that I want to talk about on this week's card, which is going to be Magomed Ankalaev versus Alexander Rakic. So if we start off by taking a look at the odds on this one, we can see that Ankalaev is the favourite to average odds of about 1.25, which is going to be minus 400 for an implied probability of 80%. And if we take a look at the odds on uh, Rakic, he's going to be around an average of 4.0 which is going to be plus 300 for an implied probability of 25%. So Ankalaev is 32 years old, 6 foot 3 with a 75 inch reach. Alexander Rakic, 32 years old, 6 foot 4 with a 78 inch reach. So we can see both guys roughly the same size. Uh, we can see Rakic is a little bit longer and taller, nothing major though. And they are both the same age. So we've got a couple juicy X factors to discuss in this one. In the video that I dropped yesterday, uh, obviously I talked about a study that I've conducted on home advantage in the United Arab Emirates for Muslim fighters when they fight non-Muslims. Within the MMA community, there is a bit of a narrative that Muslim fighters have an advantage in events in Dubai, Abu Dhabi. I know MMA gurus made a video on this and... I kind of agree with the sentiment, but like with anything betting related, obviously our mind can play tricks on us. We all do have biases and there's also such a thing as short term variance, right? Where perhaps in a short period of time or maybe even over the last year or two, we see, you know, uh, some sketchy decisions or some questionable refereeing that favors Muslim fighters in the United Arab Emirates. And then that clouds our judgment for the overall bigger picture and in actual fact, if you zoom out and look at like the last five years, perhaps there wasn't as big of an advantage in the United Arab Emirates for Muslim fighters as many people perceive there to be. So I've actually conducted a study on this 
and you can read about the study and watch a video I produced on this on my website. It's completely free. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. But basically, the study found that Muslim fighters win around 73% of the time when they fight non-Muslims in the United Arab Emirates. So straight away, that's a very strong trend to be fighting against if you're considering a bet on Rakic this weekend. And Kalev is obviously a Muslim. Rakic is not. And it isn't easy to beat these Muslim guys in the UAE. So you've got to think, you know, you've got to consider, you know, if, if you really want to fight against that trend, if you take Rakic this weekend. Having said that, another very, very strong trend is the trend that fighters that compete with staph infections almost always lose. Now, like with anything in life, there will always be exceptions to the rule. Every time I talk about this being a young man's game, someone will say, ah, but what about Daniel Cormier? You know, what about Stipe Miocic? Yes, there's always exceptions to every rule. That's why no trend is going to play out 100% of the time. But the trend is your friend until the end of the trend. And a very, very strong trend in this instance is fighters that compete with staph infections barely ever win. And if they do win, it's usually via quick finish. They very, very rarely win a decision. Of course, when Marab Davashvili fought Sean O'Malley, one of the big reasons why we liked O'Malley in that fight was because Davashvili might have had a staph infection. And again, fighters that have staph infections very, 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 very rarely win. So this is one of those situations where Ankalaev has got a strong trend in his favor. The fact that he's a Muslim fighting a non-Muslim in the United Arab Emirates. But he's also got a strong trend going against him because this definitely looks like staff. Now, of course, this could just be a cut. This could just be a small infected cut, something like that. But what I will say about my knowledge of staff infections is this zoomed in picture here actually does like staff usually when you've got that you know kind of round centralized wound in the middle with a you know you kind of see it here this pinky circle of inflammation around the outside usually this does mean that it is staff in my experience which you know will will likely significantly affect Ankalev's ability to fight to his full potential. We know that staff almost always has a big negative impact on a fighter's cardio. And to some extent, we may have seen this from Marab Devashvili in his fight against Sean O'Malley, because obviously in the fourth and fifth rounds, Devashvili slowed much more than you'd expect him to. And O'Malley was actually looking the fresher fighter out of the two late on, which certainly would, would you know, no one would have predicted. So it likely is Marab had staff in that fight and just pushed through. So that can be a cautionary tale of how much, you know, staff can influence a fighter's performance. Obviously, we've got famous examples in recent times of Benoit Sandeni gassing out after just a few minutes against Dustin Poirier. So it'll be interesting to see how Ankalaev looks this weekend. And if you're thinking of adding him to your parlays as a big favourite, so obviously, you know, very dangerous to do that now that he may be fighting with this kind of infection. So, how do these two match up from a stylistic point of view? Well, I wouldn't expect to see any grappling in this fight, simply because it's very rare that either of these guys try to take their opponents down. And Kalev is one of these guys that, even though he's a high-level combat sambo practitioner with some of the, the best MMA grappling in the division, in fact, he probably is the best grappler in the division, despite this, he very rarely uses it. He prefers to stand and bang, he prefers to stand and strike, and because of that, we very rarely see grappling from him. And of course, this cost him against Jan Blakovic, right? He used, you know, he waited way too long into the fight before he started grappling. If he had have grappled earlier against Jan, he likely would have won the belt, but he blew it. So I wouldn't expect Angeleev to try that hard to get this fight to the ground because he never does. And Rakic is pretty difficult to take down anyway, so it wouldn't be easy for Angeleev to get his grappling game going, even if he wanted to. And of course it goes without saying that even though Rakic has at times come into fights with a grappling heavy game plan, we saw him use a grappling heavy game plan against Anthony Smith. Because Ankalaev's MMA grappling is so good, his takedown offense is so good, his ground game is so good, Rakic isn't going to be able to take Ankalaev down. So this should be a stand-up fight. Now on the feet, what's interesting about this matchup is both guys have a very specific range in which they like to fight. And they're both going to be quite happy in this matchup stylistically because on the feet, 
They're both going to be allowed to fight in the range that they want to fight in. Rakic likes to stay on the outside and chip away at you with jabs and leg kicks from the outside and counter strike. And Ankalaev likes to be the aggressor, come forward, take control of the centre of the octagon, put a lot of pressure on you, put you on the back foot. And so this is one of those matchups where, you know, they're both going to be able to fight in the range that they want to. And, you know, ultimately, it's one of those fights which I think these two guys are pretty well matched on the feet. And Galeev is the better boxer. I think Rakic has, has got the better kicking game. Um, I would say the, the thing that really makes this fight quite interesting is that there are two weaknesses in Ankalaev that Rakic is reasonably well positioned to exploit. So the first being Ankalaev's, Ankalaev's susceptibility to leg kicks. And we really saw this play out in the Jan Blakovic fight where Blakovic inflicted a lot of damage on Ankalaev's lead leg. This is because Ankalaev fights in the boxing stance, heavy on the lead leg, and where he comes forward and takes control of the centre of the octagon and likes to walk his opponent down, he's obviously going to be a sitting duck to the leg kicks because Rakic can hammer that lead leg you know, with his lengthy kicks from the outside. So the leg kicks are an area where Rakic can have a lot of success here. But I also think Ankalaev has just generally got pretty bad fight IQ. Um, you know, Rakic is much smarter, much more strategic. Um, you know, he's uh, he's better defensively. He doesn't take as many risks in fight as, as Ankalaev does. You know, GSP famously said that fighting was 90% mental. And, you know, in order to become a champion and, you know, become one of the greats, not only do you have to be mentally strong, but you have to be pretty fucking smart as well. Your fight IQ has got to be on point. That's just an area where Ankalaev for me is particularly weak. We've got examples of, you know, him tapping when there's like no point, no, 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 one seconds left to go in the Paul Craig fight to a triangle. Um, you know, where he would stand and bang with dangerous strikers like Thiago Santos when he could just use his MMA grappling and win much easier without putting himself in danger. Or the Jan Blakovic fight where he was getting outstruck and he could have easily taken Jan down and dominated him on the ground, but he waited until late in the third round to do that, um, which cost him the belt ultimately. So, Ankalaev's fight IQ, pretty bad. Even in recent fights against Johnny Walker where he's preferred to stand and bang instead of grappling, you know, ultimately he got the win. But Walker's a dangerous guy. Why stand and bang with him if you don't have to? Just take him down. Make life easy for yourself. You know, uh, go win the belt, man. Don't risk getting flash KO'd. So, Rakic has got the leg kicks. Rakic has got the fight IQ. Um, but the way I feel about this fight is... If Ankalaev is able to perform at his usual level for three rounds... And the sta potential staff infection doesn't have too much of an impact on his performance then what I would say is it's going to be very difficult for Rakic to win a decision in the United Arab Emirates, which ultimately means it's going to be very difficult for Alexander Rakic to win this fight. The reason why I say that is because Rakic isn't really a finisher. He's more of a volume striker. We see that on his record. You know, the last time he knocked someone out was five years ago. Um... You know, Jimmy Manoa in his, uh, you know, in, in, in his early UFC career hasn't knocked anyone out since then. Obviously, he hasn't had tons of fights since then, but still. Rakic is more of a volume striker. Chips away at you with leg kicks, jabs. He's not really a power puncher. And so, with Ankalaev being, you know, tough, difficult to finish, Rakic not being a finisher, then we've got to ask ourselves, what are the chances that... Rakic would be able to win a decision against Ankalaev in the United Arab Emirates. And to be honest with you, I don't think his chances are good. We know that home advantage is absolutely huge in the UAE from as Muslim fighters. I've already covered this in a study. Click the link below to read that study and watch a video I've made on this topic. But if we know that Muslim fighters beat non-Muslim fighters approximately 73% of the time in UFC events in the UAE... In order for Rakic to win a decision here, he's going to have to win rounds clearly and dominantly. And I don't think his skill gap is that big on the feet to be able to do that. I think he can edge Ankalaev, but I don't think he can dominate him. I think this is likely to be a very close competitive fight. And in a very close competitive fight, I don't give Rakic much of a chance of winning a decision 
against the Muslim in the United Arab Emirates. And because Rakic isn't a finisher, it's difficult to give him a pretty good chance of winning this. Now, everything that I've just said could be negated by the fact that Ankaleev could be badly depleted as a result of this staph infection that he may have. But who the hell knows, man? Um, so this fight is a tricky one. There are, there, are, there are pretty big risk factors to bet in both guys. Now, from a betting point of view, obviously, the odds are very different. There's big risk factors to bet in Ankaleev with his bad fight IQ, his susceptibility to leg kicks, and his potential staph infection. But his odds carry an implied probability of around 80%, which means you've got to give Ankaleev a better than 80% chance to get any value here. There's no way you can do that with a potential staph infection. So if you want to bet this fight this weekend, no matter who you think is more likely to win, you've got to take Rakic because his odds give you the better risk to reward ratio. You know, for every $100 you risk, you get $300 in profit. That's a much better deal than risking $100 on a guy that may have a staph infection to only get $25 back in profit. That's a pretty shitty deal. So if you want to bet this fight this weekend, take Rakic. Probably not the most likely to win, but with the potential staff, he does have a reasonably good chance of winning, in my opinion. So, in terms of the over-under, even though Ankaleev is a very aggressive fighter, um, you know, Rakic moves well. He doesn't like to engage. Um, you know, he's pretty good defensively. It's very difficult to knock someone out that doesn't get into big exchanges and he's constantly moving away from you. Rakic likes to circle away and play the role of Matador, and he does a really good job of using his length. Won't be easy for Ankaleev to knock a guy out like that. So as a result, um, I do think it's pretty likely this fight goes deep. If we take a look at Ankaleev's record, he frequently goes deep in fights. He's been to a reasonably high amount of uh, decisions over the last few years. And you can see, you know, Rakic frequently goes deep in fights as well. So styles make fights stylistically, pretty likely to go to a decision this one i wouldn't bet on the fight to go to a decision because obviously with ankaleo's potential staff infection he could look completely terrible this weekend and the implied probability on the odds of this fight going to a decision is 62 percent so i don't see a tremendous amount of value there i don't see any value there at all but i would lean more towards fight goes to a decision uh, when we're looking at the over under and in terms of interest in prop bets I think the most likely outcome is going to be Ankaleev by decision, but the odds are absolutely terrible. Again, with him having a staph infection, you know, very, very risky to bet on him. Fighters very rarely with sta win with staph infections, so you're probably better off giving that one a miss. So I hope you found that breakdown useful. If you did, please hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. It would help this channel grow a lot i would really appreciate it you already know if these videos this week get 100 likes i'm going to be doing a bonus video on friday where i break down the most popular prelim matchups that you mentioned in the comments right now it seems pretty certain that i'm going to be breaking down the fight between abus magomedov and bruno ferreira but the other fight that i'm going to be breaking down in the bonus video on friday it's a little bit obscure i'm not too sure what it's going to be so if there's one of these fights you want me to take a deep dive into let me know in the comments below and we'll get into it now before we break down the fight between Ilya tarpuria and max holloway i want to give you guys a little bit of an update on the fight between hamzat chimaev and also uh robert whittaker now we dropped the breakdown video for this fight yesterday can watch that in the in in the description below i'll leave a link or just go to my youtube channel it's on there we drop daily videos daily breakdowns couple of fight breakdowns a day and uh it's a very interesting interview here with robert whitaker where he talks about his game plan and strategy for chimaev this weekend and that's what i love about doing these more regular daily videos now because as fight week progresses we get more information to work with. You know, we'll have the weigh-ins tomorrow. You know, we'll have the press conferences, the fighter interviews. You know, when I'm dropping videos early in the week, when new information emerges, I can't get it out to you guys. But now we can discuss this type of thing in these daily vids. So, quick rundown from the Chimaev Whitaker breakdown, if you haven't already watched it. I basically think that fight's going to come down to cardio. I think if Whitaker can make it through the first round, and if Chemaev slows like he did against Burns, slows like he did against Usman, I think that Whitaker's got a great chance of winning this. But for full context, you need to go watch the breakdown video. 
Now, what's very interesting about this clip that I'm about to play you is that it's actually pretty rare for a fighter to understand what their paths to victory are. Now, if you're not very experienced at betting on this sport, that might sound like a crazy thing for me to say, right? Because your logical brain is telling you that if you're going to be competing in a cage fight to the death in two, three months time in the UFC, you're probably going to want to know everything that you can about your opponent so you know exactly what to expect, exactly what to train for. But you would be amazed how many fighters don't do that and how many fighters instead focus on themselves or they leave the preparation, the game plan and the strategy to other people like their coaches and they don't actually really understand firsthand having seen from themselves exactly what the you know past the victory for them are and exactly what their opponent's strengths and weaknesses are so what i found really interesting about this interview is that robert whitaker clearly describes what chimaev's weaknesses are you know going into the fight this weekend and he also describes the game plan and strategy that he says he's going to use in order to beat Shemaev, which I find super interesting. So I'm going to hit play now and uh, just listen to this. It's very, very interesting. Yeah. Um, but also, we saw that Usman on a week's notice started catching up. Yes, he did. In the third round, he started catching up. And you got five rounds. And I got five rounds. And I think I'm better than Usman. Yeah, bigger for sure. Usman, well, remember, Usman's uh, still fighting that welterweight. You're had, middleweight now. I've had 20 weeks to prepare for this guy. Yeah. Had time to get ready. Yeah. So is it a matter of extending the fight, though? Is it like, no. can you go through him early, or do you have to make him fight longer? Because, again, in the first round of that fight, he was still hell on wheels for even Kamar Usman. I'm going to come at him from the first second to the last. I'm taking the fight to him the entire time. That's how I win. Yeah. You've been training a lot of wrestling in preparation for this. I saw a video of you getting after it. How, how have you enjoyed being back on that type of grind, knowing what type of fight you had in front of you? Mate, my back is sore. Dude, so <laughs> Okay, so you hear straight from the horse's mouth there, you hear Whitaker saying it himself. He's going to come after him from the very first second. This is super interesting to me because this is exactly what Robert Whittaker needs to do in order to win. If he makes Chimaev work hard early, gets Chimaev to burn through a lot of energy early in this fight, and if Whittaker can survive round one, I'm telling you right now, guys, if Chimaev gasses in the same way that he did against Usman and against Gilbert Burns, you know, we've got literally got a breakdown video of the website showing footage of this. If you're a member, obviously just go to the breakdown video section of the website. We've got footage of just how bad Chimaev looked in the second and third rounds against Burns and Usman. If he looks like that against Whitaker, he's in a lot of trouble this weekend. So go check out that video on the website and uh, go watch yesterday's breakdown if you haven't already. I just think it is super, 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 super interesting that Whitaker knows exactly what he needs to do this weekend in order to win, and he says he's going to do it, which is quite rare in the UFC, which I understand sounds illogical, but it isn't. All right, now let's break down the main event of this weekend's card, which is going to be Ilya Topuria versus Max Blessed Holloway. So if we start off by taking a look at the odds on this one, Topuria is one of many big favorites on this card. At average odds of about 1.39, which is going to be minus 256 for an implied probability of 72%. And if we take a look at the odds on Holloway, he's around an average of 2.95, which is going to be plus 195 for an implied probability of 34%. So Topuria is 27 years old, 5 foot 7 with a 69 inch reach. And Holloway is 32 years old, 5'11", with a 69-inch reach. So we can see a bit of an age gap here. Top Uria, obviously younger in his career, 15 pro fights, undefeated. Doesn't have as many miles on the clock, hasn't taken as much damage, um, hasn't put as much wear and tear on his body as Max Holloway. Holloway has obviously had you know more than double the amount of fights. He's five years older. And in terms of the body types... Both have the same reach, but Topuria has that small muscular compact frame with a lot of power. Holloway, obviously longer, leaner, lankier, uses his length and range well, even though they've got the same reach in this fight, but doesn't hit anywhere near as hard as Mr. Topuria. So straight off the bat, 
straight off the bat. Um, I wouldn't expect there to be any grappling in this fight. Neither guy really ever tries to take their opponents down that often. Holloway used a bit of grappling in his fights against Yaya Rodriguez and Korean Zombie. Uh, Topuria used grappling early in his UFC career, but every time he did, he gassed himself out and then he basically stopped wrestling. So I wouldn't expect to see any grappling here because I don't think Holloway's a good enough wrestler to take Topuria down. And I don't think Topuria would risk grappling against the cardio machine like Holloway in case he gas in case he gassed himself out. So let's just get that out of the way. I I, I think this is going to be a stand up fight. So what I'm going to do in this breakdown, I'm going to try and not make this breakdown long. But what I do want to do is show you guys as much footage as I possibly can to back up the points I'm making. Now I'm conscious if you're watching this on YouTube, I may have to blur some of the footage because the YouTube copyright algorithm does get aggressive. So if you want to watch the uncensored version of this breakdown, join my website, go to the breakdown videos uh, section of the website. You'll be able to watch it there. But I'm going to do my best to show you uh, evidence, proof of the kind of things that I'm going to talk about in this video. Because whenever we've got a matchup like this, that is obviously, you know, it's a great fight. A lot of people have strong opinions on it. Like I always say, the only place you find truth and honesty in this game is the fight footage. So if I tell you guys something that I've seen in my research, I like being able to back it up by showing you cold, hard, undeniable proof and evidence in the form of fight footage because we do not deal in fantasy. We don't deal in crystal balls. We don't deal in speculation. We deal in reality here and we focus on what is true. So what I'm going to do, I'll give you a very brief overview of how these two match up when it comes to strikings. I think this will be a stand-up fight. And then what I'm going to do is go through a bunch of footage to kind of illustrate uh, the points that, that I've made. So, I've got to be honest with you. I don't really understand why Holloway is such a big underdog in this fight. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. And I do feel like... Topuria has suddenly got all this hype behind him and has been, you know, obviously thrown into the, the, the top of the division, mixing it up against the best guys in the division. But it has been a very, very quick rise to the top. And to some extent, I do feel Topuria is in many ways very unproven. And I'm not sure if he's ready for someone like Max Holloway. I'm going to quickly go through his record and explain to you what I mean. And in actual fact, maybe, yeah, I think what we're going to do, we're going to go through this with some footage. We're going to come with receipts. We're going to back this up. So the first fight that I want to show you guys is from four fights ago, and it's Topuria's fight against Jay Herbert. Now, this fight was two years ago, so obviously Topuria has improved since this fight. But if we bring up the uh, the fight against, uh, against Jay Herbert, take a little look-see into this one right let's take a little look-see into uh, this matchup right here okay so let's take a little look if we go back to the first round sorry guys let me just skim through i'll try and make this as quick as i possibly can All right, here we go. Here we go. All right. Let me just make sure you can guys can see this. So, as always, Topuria comes out, takes control of the center of the octagon, starts putting a lot of pressure on his opponents. And one thing you'll notice about Topuria, as we see in that exchange there, is that he appears to be pretty good at being the hammer, but not so good at being the nail. So you can see that you know, when he's putting a lot of pressure on his opponents, he's very dangerous, but he's also very aggressive with it. So you get you see him eat a big shot, you know, in a combination with Jay very early in this round. Then you get, you know, you see him get dropped off that head kick. So if we just skim through, he obviously tries to use a bit of grappling then to go into survival mode. If we just skim through to later on in the round when Jay's back up to his feet. I also want you to pay attention to how sloppy Topuria is in these exchanges. Now, yes, he's, he's still going to be hurt from being dropped by that head kick. 
but I just wanted to see how bad his defense is in this sequence against Herbert. We'll just skip through. Just pay attention to how bad his, his defense is here, how vulnerable he is on the feet. Because when we get to talking about how these two match up stylistically, uh, this, this little sequence here will become very, very relevant. Now, obviously, Herbert has got a lot more power than Max Holloway. Uh, but there are some similarities between Herbert and Holloway. Striking in the sense their body types are quite similar. They both do fight quite long. Um, you know they are. You know they're they're pretty technical. They're, they're reasonably skilled on the feet. But in these positions, you can just see Topuria just looking vulnerable in these exchanges. Obviously, he's still hurt. But striking defense not the best. He's very reckless. He kind of comes forward winging these big wide hooks. You see him walk right onto a knee there. His gum shield comes out. So all I'm saying is, four fights ago, Topuria striking defense, not the best. And now two years later, he's going in there against one of the best strikers. I mean, look at that. It's a big clean right hand there, right? A couple of years later... He's going in there against, you know, one of the best strikers in the history of the UFC. So that's the Jay Herbert fight. That was literally four fights ago. Then if we look at the Bryce Mitchell fight, this is a fight where it's not so much his striking defense that becomes an issue or looks like it could be an issue. It's actually his cardio. So this is a real interesting fight because... Just at the point in this fight where it looks like Top Uria is starting to slow and Top Uria is starting to gas out, it just so happens that Mitchell's even more tired and Top Uria is able to get a finish. So here, four minutes left to go in round two. What I want you to focus on is the body language, the movement, the breathing patterns of Ilya Top Uria. Because to me, in this sequence, in this clip, he looked very tired here. He looks very, very tired. And again, pay attention to his boxing defense when Bryce Mitchell's coming forward aggressively, taking the fight to him. So again, remember, my speciality is live betting on the UFC. I am an absolute expert at reading momentum swings in fights. I can spot them very early, and it's one of the reasons why we make so much money live betting on the UFC, why we make a profit on approximately 70% of UFC events. Just look, he's a clean right hand there. Almost eats a head kick there. Look at how sloppy Top Uria looks on the feet. Eats a left hand there. You know, this is Bryce Mitchell, guys. This is Bryce Mitchell. And this was only three fights ago. How is Top Uria going to look against one of the best strikers in the history of the UFC? And then he gets the knockdown. But they're back up. And just pay attention to the body language of Top Uria here. To me, he's looking pretty tired. Kind of sloppy, just wades forward with these big hooks. But he's very reckless in these exchanges. Just so happens, Bryce is more tired. And because of that, he's able to get the submission win. Unfortunately, that fight ended a little bit too quickly. I would have liked to see that one go a little bit longer. Then you've got Top Uria go the distance with a 142-year-old Josh Emmett. Not sure how impressive that is. Emmett's obviously had his, uh, had his jaw broken in the UFC. He's had a lot of injuries, taken a lot of damage. I'm not sure how impressive going the distance 25 minutes against someone like Josh Emmett is for a guy like Top Uria. I will let you be the judge. And then he's got the flash knockout win against Alexander Volkanovsky. But again, as much as we all love Volkanovsky and as much as he is one of the best featherweights in the world, we've been talking for a long time about how the decline of Volkanovsky was inevitable because he's very old for a featherweight. You know, 36 years old, it's absolutely ancient for a featherweight. So no surprise really that a young hungry bull like Top Uria were able to benefit from father time, land a big shot, get Volkanovsky out of there. So with Top Uria, I feel like he's coming into the fight this weekend against Holloway as a big favorite. And I don't really see what he's done to deserve it. Flash knockout over Volk. You know, going the distance with a 157-year-old Josh Emmett. Um, you know, was slowing down against Bryce Mitchell. Rocked a couple times against Herbert and striking defense. It looked pretty bad. For me, kind of unproven. And now he's going in there against the cardio machine, granite chin, 
tough as nails, fights at a high pace, one of the best fighters, you know, in the history of the UFC, right? Future Hall of, Hall of Famer Max Holloway. Um, the odds on this one are just very interesting to me. They feel very, very wide. Let me know what you think in the Discord. Let me know what you think in the comments below. But the odds on this one aren't making a whole lot of sense to me. I'll be brutally honest with you. So how do I see this fight playing out from a betting point of view? Let's get comfortable. How do I see this fight playing out? Okay, we've already said there's unlikely to be any grappling. What I can tell you from looking at the footage of both these guys is that Max Holloway is much better at lightweight than he is at featherweight. I'm very disappointed, actually, that Holloway is coming back down to featherweight um, because of how good he looked in his last fight against Justin Gaethje. He looks just looks way healthier at lightweight. He's got more pop in his shots, more power in his hands. He looks healthier. He looks more athletic. He's much better at lightweight. However, I think Holloway is probably thinking to himself, you know, when Volk was the champ, I couldn't get near the belt because I fought him three times. I lost to him three times. But now the top Uriah is the champ. I think Holloway is looking at it as a different guy holding the belt, a different matchup, and an opportunity to get his belt back. And I think he's got a pretty good chance of beating top Uria. So I'm not surprised to see Holloway drop back down the featherweight for a title shot. But he is much better at lightweight. And this is a big factor to take into consideration in this matchup. Because if you watch footage of Holloway in the lightweight division and footage of him in the featherweight division, what you'll see is that Holloway really lacks the physicality, the power, the impactfulness to hurt guys in the featherweight division. When you've seen Holloway inflict a lot of damage on some of his opponents, like the Korean Zombie or more notably Calvin Cater, it tends to be death by a thousand cuts, where instead of Holloway hurting you with one or two big shots, which is essentially what he did to Justin Gaethje, uh, obviously he had the volume to go with it, but fundamentally what I'm trying to say is it was big shots that really swung momentum in Holloway's favour against Gaethje. He can't really do that at featherweight, or he very rarely does that at featherweight. Whenever he's inflicted a lot of damage on someone at featherweight or had a lot of success striking, it tends to be from landing a very, very high volume of strikes. He's just touching you, he's going for the volume, he's going for the cumulative damage, but he doesn't have a whole lot of power in his hands. To the extent that, you know, when you watch him against someone like Justin Gaethje at lightweight, when he's landing combinations or where he's landing clean hard punches on Ga Gaethje, you can see there's real impactfulness on those shots. He's really hurting Gaethje. But then when you look at Holloway against someone that is also quite muscular, also physically imposing, like a top area, you know, I'm talking about, you know, when Holloway faces someone like Arnold Allen, for example, Holloway just doesn't really seem to be able to hurt Allen that much on the feet. Yes, by the end of the, f the fight, through volume, Allen's wearing a decent amount of damage on his face, but it's not like Holloway actually really hurt him or put him in a lot of trouble in, in the fight with uh, with big shots. And that's the real issue for Holloway in this matchup, because where Holloway lacks that physicality, that power, that impactfulness in the featherweight division, that's an area where we know Top Uria has got an abundance of, of power and physicality. It takes a lot to knock a guy like Volkanovski out, and we've seen him obviously look very, very dangerous on the feet, right? He, he's reckless, yes. He's aggressive, yes. Uh, but obviously that recklessness, that aggressiveness translates into how hard he commits to his strikes. And he commits very hard, which is why he knocks motherfuckers out. At the end of the day, Topuri is a dangerous guy. So Topuri has a lot more power in his hands than Holloway. And in many ways, there are similarities between Topuri and Allen where I do feel Top Uria is most likely going to be able to walk Holloway down and, you know, land the bigger, the harder, more damaging, more impactful shots. In some ways, like Arnold Allen was able to do, Allen just wasn't able to deal with the technique and the volume of Holloway, which I have a feeling we will also see Top Uria struggle with. Because the thing about Top Uria is he appears to be one of these guys who's very good at being the hammer but not so good at being the nail. In the sense that, when we've seen him at his best in his fights against Josh Emmett and Alexander Volkanovsky, when he's on the front foot, taking control center of the octagon, using that very high level technical boxing to you know, control the distance and sustain pressure on his opponents and chip away at them from the center of the octagon, 
You know, he looked very good doing it. But whenever we've seen him hurt or tired or on the back foot, that's when he gets very sloppy and very reckless. And we know Holloway's very good at just racking up that volume, putting that volume on you, chipping away at you, chipping away at you, chipping away at you, chipping away at you. And I don't see Topuria being able to keep up with that volume. And because Holloway's chin is so good, because he's so durable, I mean, is Topuria going to be able to knock Max out? Probably not. Has Max ever been knocked out? Uh, I don't think so. If we go through his record, no, Max has never been knocked out. Will Topuria be the first to do it? Maybe. But, um, you know, you wouldn't want to bet on that because it's never happened before and Holloway's faced some absolute killers. So, before we wrap this breakdown video up, I think the last bit of stuff that I need to show you is the difference in the impactfulness of Holloway's shots in the lightweight division compared to his, the impactfulness of his shots in the featherweight division. So, if we just bring this up here in the first round... What I want to do is just show you some of the shots that, or the, some of the combinations of Hol Holloway, you know, lands in, 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 in this fight against Gaethje. And uh, how, how much stronger he looks in the lightweight division. And again, the problem with, you know, trying to show footage of stuff like this is it does obviously extend. The, you, you see there, see that clean, hard left hook that Holloway lands. Clean and hard knocks Gaethje back, knocks him off balance. All right, we'll skip through just a little bit more. Just find a couple of examples. So you obviously, you know, when it comes to striking, it's better for you to do your own research, watch these fights in, in their entirety so you can really appreciate the points that I'm trying to make. But... You can kind of just, even though that right hand didn't land very clean, you can see when we go and watch a little bit of footage of the Arnold Allen fight, you'll see a notable difference in the power, the explosiveness, the speed, the athleticism, the impactfulness of the shots the Holloway's landing with. Alright, so if we bring up the Allen fight, obviously, you know, we could keep this going for 25 minutes if we wanted to, right? Just to kind of show you Holloway in these exchanges. But to see if you don't believe what I'm trying to say, you need to go watch the fight yourself. And side by side, when you watch this fight alongside the Allen fight, you'll get it. You'll get it, man. You'll get it. You know, hard kicks, hard punches, hard boxing. Let's get into the Allen fight. So if we go to the Allen fight, what you'll see when Holloway gets into exchanges in this matchup, I mean, even here, you can see he doesn't look as healthy at featherweight. Doesn't look as healthy, doesn't move as well. Like, as we literally go from one fight to the other, you can see that. Just doesn't have the same power, the same impactfulness on his shots. What I want to really show you is an example of Holloway landing a clean punch and just not really being able to hurt Alan. Alan just takes it like there's nothing. In fact, if we go into round three, round four. You can kind of see it there, right? Holloway springs forward, lands a clean right hand, but Allen barely backs up an inch. And even here, we're in the fourth round of the fight, and Allen's barely got a scratch on him. Obviously, you know, his face a little brightened up from the jab, but nothing too major. He's quite comfortable in there. You know, considering he's almost been in there 20 minutes with Max Holloway, Allen's not looking too bad here. And knowing that this is max at featherweight and this is the most likely i like you see just leave these little combinations there it's just like max is touching you at featherweight but he's actually hurting you at lightweight 
like I say, you're probably going to have to go watch the fights yourself to see the point I'm trying to make. Watch them side by side. Um, but it's quite evident when you watch them side by side how different Max is at featherweight compared to lightweight. So, that's pretty much it for this breakdown. Uh, I think from a betting point of view, it's pretty obvious that you would have to be a crazy person to bet Ilya Topuria because at his current odds, in order to get any value on Topuria, you'd have to give him a better than 72% chance of winning, which is outrageous. If you do want to bet this fight this weekend, you have to take Max Holloway. You know, odds of 3.0 plus 200. He's just going to give you a much better risk to reward ratio for your money at that implied probability of 33%. If you risk $100 on top Uria, you're only going to make $40 profit if he wins, but you're risking 100 If you risk 100 on Max Holloway, you're going to be making like $200 profit back. So in this situation where Holloway is absolutely live, can absolutely win, chin, cardio, durability, you know, volume on his side... I think uh, I don't think Holloway is a bad bet this weekend. Um, I think he's very, very capable of causing Topuria big problems. But let me know what you think. In terms of the over-under on this one, um, it's quite likely the fight goes deep. I think if it does end inside the distance, it will most likely be Topuria gassing out and Holloway kind of stopping him late on. Do you think there's the potential for Topuria to gas in this fight because we know the type of pace that Holloway can put on you? Obviously, Topuri is going to be a tough guy. It's just a question of whether he can hang in there and survive. If he does start to tire, Holloway really starts to put it on him in the same way we've seen him put it on a guy like Calvin Cater. But I do think the fight is more likely to go deep. Um, in terms of the prop bets, the way I would look at the props is, the way I would look at the props is, if I was scouting a prop on this, the odds on Holloway by decision or Holloway by knockout or TKO are roughly the same. But in percentage terms, the odds aren't a whole lot better than they are on just betting Max Holloway straight in percentage terms, right? When you consider how much extra risk you're taking on for betting highly specific outcomes on these props. So if you really, 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 really want to bet on this fight, I would just take Holloway. I wouldn't fuck around with props or over-unders or anything like that. Because Taburia's cardio is a bit of an unknown in a fight like this. It's very different going five hard rounds against a guy like Max Holloway than five hard rounds against a guy like Josh Emmett that's just going to stay on the outside in a defensive shell, allow you to completely dictate the pace of the fight and not really make you work that hard. Holloway is a whole different challenge that Taburi is facing this weekend. So I think it's clearly dog or pass. But... Let me know what you think in the comments below. Hit the like button if you haven't already. As soon as this video gets 100 likes, we'll be dropping the breakdown video for Abu Magomedov versus Mr. Bruno Ferreira, as well as the breakdown video for Shara Magomedov and Armin Petrosian, and any other prelim fight you want me to break down. Leave a comment below. Let me know what you want me to break down. Check out my website, mabettingtips.com. Earn money for watching the fucking UFC. 70% of the time we make a profit. One more do you want. One of the best profitability charts in the history of sports betting. This is my speciality. This is my life's work. This is what I do best. This is what I'm very, very, very fucking good at. Give live betting a try. You'll see it for yourself. Thank you very much for watching. Take care. I'll be back tomorrow with another breakdown video. Have a great night, guys. Take care. Bye.